clocks we're going to look at today are probably the best value. Um, they're of superb quality. They come before the period of high industrialization and so they're all handmade, hand finished, conceived by artists and uh, sculptors and are the epitome of French taste from the end of the 18th century through to the first, end of the first quarter of the 19th century. Okay, well the first clock we're going to discuss is uh, one from right at the end of the 18th century. It dates from around about 1798, completely in far gilded ormolu, with no patination whatsoever, and it has a decidedly Egyptian influence. Now, Napoleon and uh, our generals, the British generals, were fighting in Egypt from 1795. Abu Bay was in 1798, and both the English and the French took artists to record what was going on during their campaigns. And the artists recorded the Egyptian influences, the pyramids, the temples, the hieroglyphics, and these can be seen in the Egyptian terms on this clock. You have a fine Egyptian figure, with Egyptian feet, and the quality of the casting is absolutely exceptional. If you have a look around the bezel of the clock, you can see the casting is absolutely superb. And these figures are beautifully hand chased, wonderfully finished, and very elegant. The fact that the pendulum is visible means that the clock is a little bit more interesting to look at because as the clock is, move, is working, um, you have the visible pendulum. Now, here you have the, the dial, the white convex enamel dial. The enamel is finished on copper, and uh, it's typical of the period. You have a convex dial. In other words, its shape moves out slightly and goes back in, and this is absolutely typical of the period. This clock has an eight-day bell-striking pendulum on a silk-suspended pendulum. Again, absolutely typical. The second clock we're going to look at is from slightly later, perhaps five or six years, and this introduces patinated bronze. Now, this again was a very popular feature in the Empire period where you had this amazing contrast between the fire gilded ormolu, beautiful gold, with a dark background. Again, this made it more interesting and gave some contrast. Now, again, being at right at the beginning, almost direct to our period, you have the Egyptian terms on the side, two Egyptian figures here. Um, and in this case, there are two children playing. One has a doll, he is a jester, and the other is a cupid fighting. Now, as to the dial, again, we have a convex dial, fine, pierced, gilt bronze hands, um, and uh, fine applied ormolu mounts uh, all over. The third clock we're looking at is um, one of a series of clocks produced by Jean André Reich at right at the beginning of the 19th century. He began about 1805 and continued to make the clocks or design the clocks until about 1809. And some of these were specifically designed for Napoleon and the major palaces and public rooms in the um, main uh, buildings in Paris. Now this is one of a series of three or four, and this one is known as um, astronomy. Now you have a fine female sitting classically draped at an astrolabe with a pair of dividers in her hands. The ormolu mounts are applied to the front and they show a cupid looking through a, a highly complicated telescope surrounded by stars. Um, an interesting feature of this is that um, in the Empire period particularly, um, 
and with Reich in particular, the female was almost exclusively used in areas of science and technology. Um, it was a new beginning, in, t in fact, as far as um, France was concerned. Um, women were to be educated and educators, and uh, not just to, to stay at home. They have introduced marble into this particular case, so we have um, Ormolu and uh, antique Ver marble. Um, again, bell striking movement, silk suspended, eight day technically. Again with the same uh, enamel dial on uh, a copper base, convex. This one has two pay feet. This is the only one that's signed and it's by Denier and he was a very famous bronzier. And this is a clock of hope. Uh, again, it's um, all in Ormolu and it is typical of a later empire uh, clock with a double rectangle, a horizontal rectangle and a vertical rectangle that holds the dial and movement. Now Hope is seen with uh, typical icons relating to her, um, a paddle, highly decorative, decorative beautifully uh, finished, cornucopia held up by a swan and with a fine, beautifully finished anchor, uh, which is almost always related to hope. Um, again, we have the white convex enamel dial with breguet style blued steel moon hams, again typical of the period, and um, highly decorative ormolu feet. What I've got here is the, uh, the Empire Clock of Hope, which we discussed earlier, and a very slightly later clock, Charles X period, of uh, Clio. And uh, it's a larger clock, still fire gilt, which is nice, and very, very well finished, but there are certain differences. Right, on, uh, on the clock with Clio, we no longer have the convex enamel dial. We have a gilt dial in this case, and it could be an engine turn dial. And a little later on, it would be a flat enamel dial. So you've got to look for the convex white enamel dial for an empire clock with a very, very finely finished bezel surrounding the dial. And uh, Clio has a gilt dial and no bezel at all in this case, sometimes they do have them. From about 1817 you have a different type of foot entirely. It's something called a bracket foot. So instead of the basically round foot that you found in the Empire period, whether they're 2P, which is a, a long foot, or a bun foot, which is a flattened foot, um, you now have something resembling a bracket on a piece of what you'd find on an English piece of furniture and these can be decorated. In this case, it uh, has Cupid uh, reading a book, a beautiful bracket foot, but it is fundamentally different and only found after about 1817, and that is a clear divide between what you find at the Empire period and Charles X, which is the next period of clockmaking. They still had fine clocks in the Charles X period. They're still all handmade, but we're beginning to move out of the classical French period, the finest area of French clockmaking. By 1830, although some clocks were still of extremely high quality, generally they were beginning to fall off. You still found the odd exceptional one, but taken as a whole, the quality was beginning to fall. By 1850, they were really being mass produced in very large quantities and the finishing 
tapered off dramatically. Um, so you have this intermediate period. Well, what I want to talk about now is what to look for when you're going to buy an Empire clock. First thing is the gilding. You want to check that the gilding is original. It doesn't matter if it's dirty. You can take it to a professional and it can be cleaned very cheaply and far better than if you have it regilded or you buy a regilded clock from a dealer. Um, the second thing is the feet. The third thing, you must have an original movement, and I'll show you what to look for there, and um, the design. The designs can be seen in many, many reference books, and once you get your eye in, it's quite easy to see which are, which are Empire period, or could be Empire period, and which are later. Now, providing you have a convex enamel dial, a silk suspension movement, then you're likely to be having a period empire clock, even though empire designs were copied in the late 19th century. So the points to remember. Original gilding. You need to be able to see that the gilding is original. Now, the easiest way to do that is to turn the clock upside down, and then underneath you'll see there's no trace of gilding, so this cannot have been gilded using a uh, electric process. It's not later gilding, it is original. Another simple way is to take one of these applied mounts off, they're only screwed on, and if there's no gilding on the back you know you're on a winner. It's a, a real original gilt clock. Make sure that you have a white enamel dial, um, convex, the hands generally have two styles in the Empire period. They're either like these, in blued steel, Breguet moon form. We get the moon form from this shape here. Breguet was the man that invented it. Or they'd be um, fire gilt and finely chased. Now if we turn the clock round, we are looking for a silk suspended movement and it has to have a count wheel, although this isn't a defining factor. If it hasn't got a count wheel, it is not an original movement. And you want to find a clock which is a silk suspended one. In other words, you want to be able to see that a silk is being suspended from the top of the movement and not a steel suspension, which is a later uh, invention invented in uh, about 1847 and quickly ran through um, by the uh, middle of the 1850s no clocks were silk suspended any further. And here you can see what's interesting about Ormolu. If this was uh, had been re-gilded or was a modern piece the reverse here would be gilded as well. But because labour was so cheap in the early 19th century and gold so expensive, they never wasted the gold. So where, where something wasn't going to be seen, they would never waste the gold. And that's the joy of fire gilding. It go, went on as a paste, and so they could put it on where they wanted to. With modern um, plating, gold plating, they would, the whole thing would be covered in, in gold, but it would be very thin and have very little texture. I'm now going to remove the movement. It simply drops out from the front, and now we can have a look at it. Now, the timekeeping, the time is released through this little lever here, which is called the escapement, and time escapes through there, and that runs, allows the wheels, as if I remove this bell, the pendulum runs within something we call indelicately the crutch. And if I put this on here, you'll be able to see what I mean. As the pendulum moves to and fro, 
it releases one tooth from the escapement. And that's how time is released. As you can see, these movements are absolutely beautifully made. Very fine workmanship. And they were clever enough to make sure that they didn't have two soft metals together or two hard metals together. <coughs> so the wheels run in pinions. These are the pinions. The pinions are steel and the wheels are brass. So you have soft with hard and that means that there will be no wear. Now, you have two trains in these movements. The left hand one is generally the striking train. The right hand one is the time train. This is what shows, moves the hands and the left hand one is what makes the noise, if you like. So we put the bell back on and these have beautiful cast bells. Modern bells are pressed steel. These are made from bell metal and are cast. And this is released on the half hour and on the hour by what is called the count wheel, which is this wheel here. And that, this clever device allows it to ring a prescribed number of times. That rang seven times, seven o'clock, and you can hear the long note that it makes. Um, and it's most important that if you're buying a French Empire clock, that it has this type of escapement and not a later still suspended one. Okay.